prep, even for Sunday, uh, <clears throat> and knowing today, bringing us to Matthew 9, we're looking at verses uh, 35 to the end of the chapter. So I'm going to read it aloud, and then uh, begin in here, and, and maybe, yeah, let me read it aloud, and then, and then uh, we'll begin from there. So Matthew 9, follow along again in your copy of God's Word, verses 35 uh, to the end. Uh, let me read it now. <clears throat> and Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So again, Matthew 9, why are we here? Well, part of it is because of the series that we're going through right now. So the nine marks of the healthy church. Again, not really so much what a church is, although there is some overlap in that as we look at what a healthy church is. But again, what a healthy church is. And so we've gone through uh, four marks. This is the fifth mark today, but to review gone through expository preaching, so really exposing God's Word. What does God's Word say? Really what we're praying before we open up God's Word this morning. Uh, Biblical theology, the second mark, is there biblical theology being preached, being understood, being agreed on by the church, which is really the whole story of the Bible. Are we understanding it rightly in light of the cross, before the cross, at the cross, after the cross, understanding who Christ is? And then the gospel, well the gospel really is the good news of who God is in light of the reality of who we are. And so, uh, fourthly then, we looked at conversion. So conversion is not uh, an optional thing. It's not a work of man that we can uh, just make converts. This is a work of God. But it is a good work, and it's a work that must take place. And so, uh, today we come to evangelism, our fifth marker. <clears throat> so evangelism, which is why I've titled the sermon Evangelism, because it's the fifth marker. That's a really creative name. I just thought I'd throw that out there. I thought you'd be more in awe about that, actually. So, But anyhow, it's called evangelism. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at now. We've looked at Matthew 9, and in Matthew 9, we just read this, and you, maybe you saw it as we walked through it, but there's some illustration being made, and there's some farming language, which I love. Love farming language. I am a wannabe farmer. Uh, I'm certain at some level I'll be farming in heaven. And someone said to me once, they're like, well, you are farming. You're a sheep farmer. And I was like, oh, okay, touche. That's interesting. But I've always always been interested in farming, I guess particularly grain farming. Uh, Jesus says this in this passage. He's speaking of the harvest, and you maybe saw it there. So ding, ding, ding. If you're like wannabe farmers, you're like, oh, the harvest, that's exciting. He's talking about the harvest, but he's talking about the harvest as an illustration about the lost. So when he's saying harvest, he's actually not talking just about farming and it's going to happen this fall and, you know, Lord willing. He's talking about lost souls. So for the grain farmer, though, for the grain farmer, the harvest is like everything. It all comes down to the harvest. And so there's preparation for the ground, there's tilling of of the ground, there's fertilizing, there's Uh, putting in the seed, there's praying for rain, praying for warmth, uh, praying against hail, and uh, apparently there's some tornadoes not too long ago, I think it was this last week in Alberta, man, he's praying against that for sure, but he's hoping and and, and praying through the season that there'd be uh, growth, the grain would ripen, that it would dry uh, properly, and it would be healthy, and then when harvest comes, he'd reap that harvest, it kind of the whole year is about that. You hear a coffee shop and the farmers are all talking. They're all talking ultimately with harvest in mind. It's like the same talk all the time because it matters. It's what they're all about. So all the, all the work anticipates the harvest. Is it going to be a, a bumper crop or are we going to have to use crop insurance? Like how's, how's this going to go? What's it going to look like? Well, none of this really is that exciting Unless you're like me and you're sitting here just like, man, t- tell me more about harvest. That's so exciting. But if you're a wannabe farmer, maybe, maybe it's exciting. If you're a farmer, maybe on some levels. Uh, but if you're not, this isn't really that exciting, quite honestly. We hear, we hear harvest and it's like, ah, 
But for the farmer, it does matter so much. It matters so much. Again, it's what they talk about, pray about, fight for, work for, uh, spend their money towards. It's all invested in the farm and looking towards harvest. Well, I want us to know, church, as we look at this passage, that uh, whether you like it or not, uh, you are a farmer. If you are in Christ, then you are a farmer, and you are, no matter who you are, no matter what age you are, part of the harvest. You're part of the harvest, the harvest for souls. Much better than coffee talk. Uh, The harvest for souls, and you are a farmer. It's what we pray about. It's what we fight for, we work for. And we're going to see in this passage there's work to be done. Uh, there's, there's a heart to have in this that uh, maybe, maybe is not yours right now or it has been in the past and it's maybe gone cold, but a heart that just breaks for the lost. This is our, our whole heart is towards this. It's what we work for. And so we're going to see this. And so we are farmers and the big idea is this. Uh, it's time or it's harvest time. It's harvest time. first point of three being this there's a job to do we are farmers so harvest should excite us and guess what the harvest is now it's harvest time so again first point being this there's a job to do a look at verse 35 so jesus in a sense here models the work that's to be done says jesus went throughout all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. It's interesting because you look at the context here and whether this happened immediately before Jesus says this or not, it's certainly within the fairly immediate context that he is accused of doing some work, but it's not harvest work. He's accused of doing the work of demons, of Satan. That's that's the opposite. He's, He's accused of this work but in fact, he's doing kingdom work. It's so interesting. He's, he's credited with doing the work of darkness, but he's doing the work of the kingdom of light. And look, he's doing it uh, everywhere. Look where he does it. <clears throat> he went throughout the cities and villages. His focus wasn't just urban or rural. It was all over. It wasn't just Barhead, if anyone knows where Barhead is, or Edmonton, right? It wasn't just Gibbons. If anyone knows where Gibbons is, like where's Gibbons? Or Edmonton, right? He's, he's all over. Here, urban, rural, like he's, he's going everywhere. And it's interesting too, he's not just going to like big city, small town. Look where his focus is. It was in the synagogues. Verse 35, he says he's teaching. He's going to all these places. Doesn't matter where. But he's particularly honing in on the synagogues. He's teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. You could say, in a sense, he's going to the churches and he's preaching the gospel. The synagogues were places where they would come for the instruction of God's word. Probably began to happen after exile. They came back after being exiled and they started setting up these synagogues. The temple at that time had been destroyed. And so kind of this, this tradition almost came of them gathering together, being under the preaching, the teaching of God's word. So then Jesus comes and he's proclaiming the gospel in these gatherings. He goes to the churches to preach, again, the gospel. So he wasn't coming to be like, oh, hey, I'm the evangelist. Uh, At the end of the sermon, here I am. Let me preach to you the gospel. He's not doing that. He's coming and he's, he's preaching the gospel the whole time. He's like this itinerant preacher that comes in and and he's particularly he's certainly preaching the gospel to any who would have been gathered there to hear the teaching of god's word just like this morning but he's primarily i believe preaching to the leaders in the synagogue he's preaching to the shepherds and you look at matthew 23 verse 15 he says woe to you scribes and pharisees you guys that know the word you're writing god's word write down you scribes you pharisees He says, hypocrites, woe to you. For you travel across sea and land, you go everywhere, to make a single proselyte. So, you know, a Gentile coming to be a Jew. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of, listen, hell as yourselves. 
you think I'm doing the work, he says, of Satan, but you are doing the work of Satan. And he's going to these places and he's preaching the gospel to them. It would be like someone coming and pulpit supply. It would be uh, holidays uh, soon for me and we'll have different people filling the pulpit. And if they came to fill the pulpit and they're like, my primary job here is to finally preach the gospel and to hopefully save your pastor. That's what's happening. This is a big deal. He's going to these places to do this and he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So what's the kingdom? The gospel of the kingdom. Well, it's not a, a partial gospel where it's just kind of like a, a secondary gospel. Or, hey, hey, you should consider this gospel. Here's one gospel among many. It's called the gospel of the kingdom. No, it, it's, it's not a secondary gospel. It's not a weak gospel. It's the kingdom eternal, the only kingdom, God's kingdom. Calling people under the rule and reign of Christ. That's what he's doing. He's, he's calling that. He's not calling them to, hey, you know, if you'd want to make Jesus your best friend or, if, you know, if, if you think he could really help you out. He's preaching the kingdom. You have no choice. God is king and creator, and so he's preaching this gospel to them, which is the only gospel. It's the upside-down kind of kingdom, theologians would say. If you remember our time in the Beatitudes, maybe you know why I'm saying upside-down kingdom is a term that they use. Because maybe you know why would it be called the upside-down kingdom? It doesn't look like on earth like a normal kingdom. Well, if it's kingdom, I should be just swimming in riches then. We should not have any issues. We should have no enemies because our king destroys them. But it's not the case. The kingdom's upside down. Those who are persecuted are blessed. If you're uh, poor, you're actually rich. Like it's the upside down kingdom. He's preaching the true kingdom. It's infinitely better than any type of false kingdom you can get in this life. The last will be first. The first will be last. Lose your life to gain life. He's preaching this kingdom. And perhaps you've heard that kingdom, and I think many of us, we've heard that kingdom. And it's good to hear that again and again and again and again and again. So this is what he's preaching. The good news of the kingdom ruling and reigning and affecting, and I will say this, all of life. <laughs> Not just like, hey, this is kind of good for Sunday and Sunday morning, and maybe whatever happens after, maybe, maybe Monday, I don't know about Tuesday. This is all of life for the rest of your life, for eternal life. Certainly now. And so it goes on, and we kind of get this illustrated that it affects and it, and it dominates all things. Look at verse 35 again. He says he goes and he's preaching the gospel and then he's, he's healing. Like everything. It says healing every disease and every affliction. We sang that with actually the last song that we sang. He's healed the blind, the lost and the lame. So we've proclaimed that. So this is what our God does. He heals the lame, the lost. Or sorry, the blind, the lost and the lame. You can see all, all, all. There's nothing missed. <clears throat> There's nothing missed. There's nothing where he comes across it and he's like, I mean, I want to heal this, but I just, I can't. Or that's not really important, so I won't. Or I don't have the time. You just see like the kingdom dominates all things. Complete domination. We see this a little bit in, I was, I was going to use the illustration of, well, now I'm kind of using it and saying it, but of like winter coming, but I won't because that's depressing. The days are getting shorter. You just need to know that. It's reality. But let's think about spring, right? And, and the domination that happens in spring. So in winter, it always amazes me. In winter is most of the time in Alberta, right? And you know, back to whatever the good news, right? But spring's coming and you look at everything and you're like, everything is dead. There is no life. Like how in the world can you get a sunburn in Alberta? It must, it's impossible. But then spring comes, and then you see the impossible happen, and spring has its way. It's cold, it's hot, it's the rest of it, and eventually it just, it wins. And summer comes. And there's not, there's no, I guarantee there's no one here in their house, and they're like, actually, winter's still here. And it's here it is in the corner, there's snow and blizzards today. No, it just dominates. And this is the kingdom, it just, it's a domination and a rule over all things. And so Jesus has done this work. He's illustrating for us really what he's doing, but we know the gospel. He's illustrated in it in what he has done in who he is and the cross and the resurrection. He's, he's done the work for us and, and the work of the gospel of the kingdom goes everywhere. It's to be taught everywhere. It has its rule everywhere. And we need to know that too. It's, it's, this isn't, hey, this is kind of my thing and, and uh, hey, I don't know, tell me what you think but, and hopefully I don't offend you. No, Every single soul that's ever been created by God, this is the kingdom, this is for them. And without this, it's only another kingdom. The kingdom of darkness. The kingdom apart from their God and king. 
And so there's complete domination that the Lord has completed in the cross and made possible for those that would come to Him. We know, again, Beatitudes, He's fulfilled the law. Christ has done that. He's Lord over the kingdom. He's Redeemer of it. And so our job then, the job that's to be done, is not to do Christ's work. Right? And sometimes I think we do that. We try to even like bring the Lord into that somehow. Uh, if I can just make sure to get your suffering to go away, then, then I'm really doing kingdom work. And it's like, not necessarily. If I can just um, pray hard enough to make sure you're healed, then I'm doing kingdom work. And it's like, not necessarily. Our job is to proclaim the good news of the kingdom, which means not necessarily that you will be healed in this life. And Christ did this, I believe, to show complete domination. Uh, if he wants to heal you, he'll heal you. But what he offers you is much better. It's not a temporary healing, though that would be good. And he offers you something infinitely better. Though you're sick, he offers you a new life one day, a resurrected body that will never die, that will be different than the one you have now, yet still physical and fit for heaven. Something infinitely better than that. He doesn't promise, he promises peace, but maybe not in the way that you think. Our job is to present people, look, do you know there's peace with God? Though there's still war in your life. Though people, yeah, want to kill you today. Though work is really tough. Let me tell you a peace that's infinitely better and true and lasting. And so we proclaim the gospel in this way. Suffering, again. You think of suffering. We suffer with Christ. You see someone who's suffering that doesn't know the Lord, you can just try to take their suffering away. Or you can show them, look, let me help you understand what suffering is about. Let me help you understand all the things that are unanswered and remind you or show you for the first time what was accomplished through the, through the suffering of Christ. So we proclaim again the good news, contentment. Contentment with God, though you're missing out on so many things. Riches, we say, man, you need to know you will never get enough riches. Let me tell you about riches. And we proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. You, you'll never have enough. And, and you can't have enough taken away from you even. You have God, an inheritance, and you have God himself. And all the riches, in a sense, that come from that. And so this is the type of things that we begin to understand and we preach. So we're called to share the gospel of the kingdom. And again, and I've said it again, this is something, Lord willing, and Lord, keep us in a place where we will never get tired of this. We'll never look for a second type of kingdom or hope or something we think that works. We won't just get tired of it and like, I need something different. But again, the gospel of the kingdom, that Jesus is king. The gospel starts with God. We do that when we were running um, Redemption Kids. Right? We go through the, the gospel plan for me, I think it's called. All right? Starts with what? Kids, what's the gospel plan start with? Can you remember? It's been a while now. <laughs> okay, so Jesus is, God is, God rules. I was going to say Jesus king. God rules where it starts. That's great. Sadie, that's great. That's courageous. And we're going to remember that. It starts with God. He's king. That's the gospel. It doesn't start with us. You, you present the gospel to someone you're saying, let me tell you about God. We don't give them something to just meet their needs. He will meet all your needs in ways that are infinitely better than you could ever imagine. He's king. He's created us. And then sin separated us from God, right? This is, this is the bad news of it. But then Christ is the one who became man, fully God and fully man, and he reconciles us back to God. We've looked at this through the different markers of a healthy church. So now you have the opportunity, friend, neighbor, to know God, to be back with him, to, to live in a way that you were created to live. Christ was punished for us, and he offers us his righteousness. Any who would repent, believe in him, will be saved by grace through faith. Not a work of man. It's for everyone, everywhere, all time, for the whole world. And the last thing I want to say to this then is uh, what evangelism is not. Now, Nine Marks gives this. I'm stealing this from uh, the Nine Marks book. But Nine Marks says this, evangelism is not. And so there's a couple points here for you. Five, and I've added a sixth one. Now, I just want to make sure that we are knowing what it is so that we're actually doing it. So first one is this, it's not imposing your beliefs. I do not mean, they do not mean, I'll just say this, I do not mean uh, being urgent or pleading with people. 
but imposing means making a convert. Like, and I've done this. I've, I've, I've been smooth enough and, and been uh, sequential enough to have people pray in a way that, like a sales pitch where they almost can't get out of it. And I'm telling you that I've led people through false conversions. It's not imposing. The facts aren't mine to give. They're not yours to give. They're God's. So we give God's facts, not our own facts. And then we tell them. That's what we're called to do. God is the one who does the heart change. Not you. Ever. But man, if you present that gospel, let let God be God and do that work. And he does a much better work than you and I ever could. So it's not imposing your beliefs. Second, it's not your personal testimony. It might come out through your personal testimony, but do not think that sharing your personal testimony, your experience with God, is the gospel. It might be sharing the gospel, depending on how you share it, but just sharing your testimony is not evangelizing. We need to share the truth of who God is and who man is. Not just your experience. Third, it's not social action or political involvement. Primary problem is between us and God, not man and man. Now, again, I'm not saying don't share your testimony or, or don't pray for God to be glorified in the government in ways he's not right now, he's being dishonored. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that evangelism is not reforming uh, politics. It's not. Four, it's not apologetics. So it's not just proving that you're right through Scripture. It's not, I, I showed someone that evolution is not of God and creation is. That's not evangelism. Fifth, it's not results. It's not results. To evangelize is to proclaim again, not to convert. And then lastly, in addition, is it's not actions. Okay, so we even say like a courageous evangelism, and you can, maybe you can read that, maybe the keyboard's in the way, but courageous evangelism, word and deed. Evangelism is word. The deed will follow and prove, in a sense, the word. But some people say, and they've taken things out of context, say, you know, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. That's a lie. The enemy loves that stuff. No, 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 preach the gospel with your words and your actions better follow. And they will. If, it's, if you are in Christ, they will follow. But you are not preaching the gospel if you just give someone a meal or do something that is godly and right. No, you have to tell them about the one who is the bread of life. You know what I mean? Like, and the words have to come out of your mouth. In church, we need to know this. And we can't be, we can't be content with just, well, no, I, I said something. Or even I said the name Jesus. The name Jesus is being said by a lot of people, whether it be in movies or in church organizations or wherever. It doesn't matter. The demons say the name Jesus all the time. We need to preach the gospel. We, we need to declare it, which is what evangelism is. And it's harvest time. It's harvest time. So we declare, in a sense, the work of Christ. That's the work to be done. It's been done in Christ, and ours is now to point to that finished work. Secondly, uh, it's harvest time, and there is a heart to have. <clears throat> There's a heart to have. Look at verse 36. So when Christ, when he saw the crowds, so that is like, man, the crowds, you can just, like every type of person, right? Like every type of experience, viewpoint, past. He saw the crowds and he knows them. And he knows them. Right? What happens? It says here, when he saw them, he had compassion for them. That word compassion is like suffering. It literally means like to suffer. His heart suffered for those that he saw. Man, it's good for me to, to hear that. Like, do I even allow myself to see, first of all, and then secondly, to, to see with the eyes of Christ? His heart broke, you could say. He had compassion for them. He's moved. That's the kind of language that I think we would use, and, and it makes sense for us. He didn't see just homeless people or jobless people, uh, some of his friends, or people who have no friends, uh, people without purpose. He saw a whole mixed group. He didn't just see them as those like wanting something again from him. Remember, if you... You don't have to go too far back. 
And remember what the crowds did to him. There was times where the crowds were like, you're king. And then like five seconds later, they're like, where's the nearest cliff we can push you off of? He didn't see a crowd that was like just unpredictable. You know, he's, his heart has compassion for these people. I mean, you can imagine them coming. He feeds the 5,000, like, do something cool again. Can you do something cool? And instead of like, are you kidding me? Do you not know anything? He has compassion for them. It's incredible. My, my view for people, and I'm not just saying the people I would handpick. Crowds of people, you pick them all, a mixed bag. So man, there's a lot of views I can have about a whole lot of people. They're unstable, they're annoying, they're scary, they're inconvenient, they're disgusting, they're hard, they're too far gone, maybe they're a project. Oh, there's a project for me. His response is compassion. How is his response compassion? What would stir my heart? What would stir your heart to have compassion for souls? When we see it, he says, verse 36, he goes on, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I mean, you, 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 have, you have to think for a moment and just like pause enough to think the reality of what Christ is seeing and saying. And why his heart's breaking? He says, harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Other translations say, bewildered and helpless, distressed and dispirited, distressed and dejected. I want you to get an idea of what he's saying. Uh, That they fainted or were scattered abroad, weary and worn out. So what are these people kind of like? We get the idea, the description. Okay, they're, they're not in a good spot. And Christ says, you know what this is like? This is actually like something. My heart breaks for these people because this is how they are, but it's like something. And he illustrates it for us. He tells us they're like sheep without a shepherd. That's what they're like. There's no clarity. There's no direction for them. There's no protection. They're in deep trouble. They're lost. They're confused. They're maybe scared. They ought to be. And he sees them the way that they ought to be seen. Now, maybe I'd even say this when we're even just talking amongst one another as brothers and sisters and you're hearing language of harassed and helpless. And this is me like every day in different ways at different levels. But we hear this language amongst each other for sure. But here's the thing that our heart can, can break and have compassion. We hear that language and hear, man, you're, you're just harassed right now. You, you're helpless right now. But you know what the difference is with a brother and sister is, but you have a shepherd. And so it's like, brother, I can remind you of your shepherd. Or you can remind me. Or sister, I can remind you. And it's like, yes, harassed and helpless, but not without a shepherd. That's a, that's a big thing. That's not even a big thing. That's, that's a whole thing. Like, if you're harassed and helpless and have a shepherd, there is hope for you. Not just hope, maybe you have hope. But if you don't have a shepherd, that's the difference. If you're harassed and helpless without a shepherd, you have to hear this. You are dead. You are worse than dead. And harassed and helpless is a good way to describe it. So Christ sees that and his heart breaks for them. And and we know John 10 says, Christ is himself. We think shepherd, he's the good shepherd. He says, I am the good shepherd. Our heart needs to be that people would be shepherded. And hear that. Evangelism really is like, do you have a shepherd? Not here, here, you want some things even from the shepherd? We'll call him a shepherd. No, it's, are you shepherded? Are you part of the flock? Courageous evangelism is, is again, and I'll say it, not proclaiming you need comfort you need to be unharassed. You need to be helped. That's not evangelism. No, no, no. You need to be shepherded. The other stuff follows. The other stuff makes sense. But it's not primary. Without a shepherd, you're dead. And we need to, we need to have that heart of compassion, which was the same heart of compassion someone had for us when they shared the gospel with us. Man, you, you are like I was. 
Man, I was harassed and how I was dead man walking. And let me tell you about the shepherd. That is very, very different and so much stronger and true than some weak gospel that just hands out things to people. And you can't compete anyhow. Oh, you, you want peace? I think I can find it here. Satisfaction? Actually, it's working on a shepherd. You need a shepherd and all those things come from him. It's harvest time, and so there's a job to be done, there's a heart to have. And then last, finally, third point, there is a command to obey. A command to obey. It is interesting, we read Matthew 9, who is the great evangelist? You know, who's the greatest evangelist, do you think, ever? Billy Graham? Some of you maybe don't know who Billy Graham was as we get older. Maybe you, maybe you know a Christian, you're like, no, if so-and-so can talk to him. No, doesn't the Bible even say, like, there's people with the gifts of evangelism? Yes. Who's the greatest evangelist? Christ. God. The Spirit of God. Like, we, we have Jesus Christ in the flesh. You could say the greatest evangelist. Pure compassion for the people. His heart breaks for them. He's suffering in his heart because of them. So here's Christ. Greatest evangelist hearts breaking for the people and look what he does it is very interesting i love sometimes taking verses and you're like just cover them up what does he say next i don't know i'm not looking what do i think if i didn't know the passage how would that finish he says all right here i go and i'm just going to do it all well he could and in some ways he needs to but he turns to the disciples that's incredible he turns to the disciples he says, then he said to the disciples, he turns his attention to us. He doesn't need us. But in his wisdom, he's decided and he turns the attention towards us. And what does he want them to know? Listen to what he says. He turns his attention to them, to the disciples, and he says this. And this is what God wants us to know. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. He says, Listen, you need to know there are a ton of souls that are ready to be won. That you could say it in a different way, are are right there, ready, ready to just be gathered in. There's a ton of them. There's plenty of them. Like, I need to hear that. Do you ever just feel sometimes like no one's coming to Christ? Sometimes you maybe feel it even within our church, just the slow growth, right? It's like, how in the world? Where are they? There's nobody. And Christ is saying, listen, you need to know. Hear this. The harvest is not a small harvest. It's a bumper crop. It's plentiful. There's lots and lots and lots of souls. You know, I thought again, I don't know why I keep doing this, but numbers again. <clears throat> Maybe it's Tim Garkey, math guy. He's had a bad influence on me or something, but bear with me. A million people in Edmonton will say, roughly, whatever. If you take... 10% of that. You know how many people that is? It's 100,000 people. Let's take 1% of a million. It's like nothing. It's nothing. Well, just 1% of a million is 1,000. Sorry, 10,000. 10,000. Yeah, if I get it wrong, you can remember it. All right, 10,000. 10, that's 1%. He says the harvest is plentiful. We're talking 1%. There are thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of people within our area that we hit as a church, and some people live in Gibbons and some in Barhead, just so you know. And there are ten, tens of thousands of souls. He says, listen, church, you need to know they're there. The harvest is plentiful. Man, I need to hear that. Sometimes I get discouraged, and it's like, what's the point of evangelizing? Like, no one's going to come. It's actually plentiful. And then listen, he says again, listen. The harvest is plentiful, but again, listen, child of God, like church, listen. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. They're few. It's not that there's a lack of farmers. There's a lack of farmers who are farming. The laborers are few. John 4, 35 says, Do not say <clears throat> there are yet four months. And I know September, it's coming. Then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for the harvest. 
Again, we say it's harvest time. The harvest is plentiful, but he's saying there's not enough help. There's not enough help. And so um, I came across this. I don't know how, but I did, and I'm going to just share it. I've got a picture here for you. There's in 2015, there's a man named Carl Bates. What if his family could know we're using him as an illustration right now? He's an Illinois farmer, so that's in the States, just so you know. He had terminal cancer, and a uh, community basically came around him and farmed for him. So what would have taken a week it took 10 hours. And he had this impossible job that was big, just didn't have enough help. And then he got the help. The harvest was plentiful, but the workers were few, and he certainly couldn't do it. In the past, he would have, would have taken a week, would have got it done. I think it's a great illustration for us to say, look at, look at the fields. You can see there the tractors, the combines, and they're ripping through the fields, and they're, they're gathering in the harvest. And Christ is saying the harvest is not the problem. I will save who I will save. We need farmers. We need laborers. And the laborers are few. So come, and this is the picture I want us to have as even Redemption Church. This is what we're to be doing, is running through the fields. You say, like, I don't know. I don't know again if I'm like that person. Listen to what the Word of God is telling us. He says, therefore, again, because souls are ready to be saved, but the farmers are few, what are we to do? All right, go get them. Go get them. Go get to it. No. What's he say? You can see it there. So he says, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So the prayer is, is, the prayer here is not to save people. Pray to save people, yes. Do that. But here, the prayer is to send people. You need to see that. This is a prayer to send them. Not even like find them necessarily. It's like they're there. Like send them out. The word he uses, send out, he's like, pray for this. Pray they get sent out. Thrust out. Like kicked out the door. Like move it. He said, pray for that. That's what he's praying for. It's really interesting, you know, looking at this. I, I kind of, honestly, I think I, I looked at it more just like pray for salvation. Yes. But pray for us as brothers and sisters that God would kick us in the butt and thrust us out the door and send us out. I've said it before with, again, our distinctive courageous evangelism. The program is not just here one person. The program is the people. It's us as a church. You're the program. <laughs> you want to say it that way. To be sent out. To be thrust out. And so, like, the prayer is like, convince us. Convince me. Lord, kick me out. And you say different things like, I'm not ready. And maybe you've been there. I'm not. There's a couple things. It's not going to be exhaustive. There's maybe something going on in your heart right now where you're like, ah, yeah, but. I'm not ready. I don't know enough. I'm not much of a talker. I'm an introvert. Hey, did I tell you about introvert, extrovert? It's a really cool thing. And we have all these things that we, we, we put in our way to say, well, I'm scared. I'm inexperienced. I don't know my Bible good enough. One of the best ways to get your Bible, is, like to know it, is to start sharing the gospel. Do you have Christ? Then you knew your Bible well enough. Someone preached to you that you understood it well enough that you came to Christ that you can now share about a shepherd. And let me tell you, the greatest way to grow is to begin to share about the shepherd. Because someone says, like, what do you mean? That's all he can do or this or what about that? And you're like, I don't, I've never, hmm. And you start working through it. There's nothing greater. There's nothing greater for your growth. Maybe say things like, well, I, I just don't know if I have the gift. We're all called to it. Clearly, we can see that in this passage. It doesn't always work. It seems like it's not working. The harvest is plentiful. So Lord, like thrust us out. And some of you, and I want to encourage you too, as, as you've done that, man, it, there maybe is nothing more encouraging, few things more encouraging than when you've done that and then you share with me. We share amongst each other and say, I just did this and let me tell you uh, what I was able to sh share and what someone came to know for the first time. Or we have a baptism in the fall and it's someone, whether it's one of your kids or whether it's someone from work, and they understood the gospel. Like, what an encouragement. Like, the harvest is plentiful. And, he, and we start to see the, the gathering in of the harvest. And again, sent out. And so, to be clear, we're not trying to bring them in here. 
I've said it before, you bring someone to church, say, hey, come to hear about Christ, but we're worshiping Christ. We're not going to water anything down or make it so that, oh, that kind of makes sense to you or you like that or this idea of seeker sensitive. We're gathering this morning, and hopefully you know this, to worship the name of Christ, to lift high the name of Christ, that we would leave and be like, who's the preacher? I can't remember at all. But let me tell you about Christ. That's why we're here to gather. We're not going to change that. We can't change that. People can come. You know, there's a good chance they may get saved because they're going to hear the gospel all the time because that's what we celebrate all the time. But seeker sensitive is this passage. You're sensitive to seekers or to, to those who are seeking, to those who don't know the Lord. Then be thrust out and go and pray that we go. Pray that you go, pray that I go, and we need, we need to go. And time is urgent. That's the, you want to talk seeker sensitive, there's it is. So we can be a seeker sensitive church. Maybe don't say that because people will interpret it wrongly. <laughs> But maybe say it and be like, this is what I mean. But we are. We are seeker sensitive. And so we are commanded to do what? Say that we've already looked at it, but commanded to pray. And again, pray earnestly. That's the type of prayer right now. So you leave here today, you're going to pray. Pray how? Earnestly. Really, you're begging God. And, and the tense there is like now. He's not like, hey, maybe tonight, if you have time, make time and, and do that. The tense there is like... In a sense, like, pause, game, let's pray right now. And pray earnestly, he says. And you know, actually, with that in mind, um, let, let me pray right now, and if you pray with me, and we're going to pray uh, for this right now. He says, pray earnestly for laborers, right, to be sent out to Hazarba. So why don't you pray with me right now? I'm just going to pray aloud, and, uh, and let's do that, okay? So, Father, we don't want to even not read your word and, and hear here that we are commanded to pray and the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few, and you, you tell us, Lord, here, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And I pray right now, even maybe uh, we have people within our church coming to mind. Maybe there's someone, you know, a, a face comes to mind, a name right now, or that we're praying for our brother or sister within our church. Would you give them courage at work? Would you give them courage at home? Would you give them courage within your extended family as they go on holiday or whatever it would be? Father, right now we pray earnestly, please, Lord, would you thrust us out? Lord, forgive us for not being thrust out, for, for making excuses and for not evangelizing, not proclaiming the gospel or thinking, ah, they're not going to be able to handle it. This is going to be too heavy for them. Lord, you've called us to this work of proclaiming the good news Lord, send us as a church. And Lord, would we, and we're not just praying this now, would we be a praying church that this would be a habit? And Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus, would we see a baptisms this fall? And, and even from this prayer right now, Lord, that as we pray as a church, Lord, you would send us out and that we would, we would have testimony. Hey, let me tell you how this week went. Let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you the opportunity that I had. Let me th tell you the opportunity that I made in Father of the courage we would say that, that we had. And then, Lord, we're praying, Lord, would we see fruit, that harvest gathered in. So, Lord, we pray it and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Again, we're told here to pray earnestly. And I think, when we think prayer, and I think for most of us, like, it's a, it's a growing habit. It's not a, this is not a slam to us as a church. This is, I'm going to say every church. And, and, and if you're in Christ, you are going to struggle through growing in prayer more than any other discipline maybe that there is. So I'm assuming that we struggle through that. And maybe where you still pray most is uh, during meals. So earnest prayer is not really something that you see other people do maybe or do yourself unless the meal's really bad and you're like, Lord, it's time for earnest prayer, right? Like typically you don't, you don't see that. So this idea he says of earnest prayer is, is is you're, you're begging God. And I would just ask you, you know, not when's the last time you prayed begging God for supper? When's the last time that you begged God, maybe period in prayer? When's the last time you begged God to send out laborers into the harvest? You beg God for me. Send Kyle out. Give him courage this week. Uh, his wife, Julie, she grocery shops. Like, give her opportunities or send her out. Like when have you begged God for that? Like, I need to do that. So I would just challenge us, admonish us, do that. 
obey God for this. He says here, pray remembering also who we're praying to. Pray earnestly, but remember. He says here, don't just pray to the Lord. He says, the Lord of, and you can see it there, verse 38, of the harvest. It's important for us to know that. When you pray, you beg God, send us out, but remember, you are the Lord of the harvest. So yes, like, move me. Send me out. But also, like, just knowing this, what does the Lord of the harvest mean? Well, it means he's not just the farmer that owned the field. He owns it all. Okay, every bit of it, he is sovereign, ruler, sustainer of souls, of all things. He owns the field. He foreknows those who will come to him. He chooses, in a sense you could say, the crop. He brings life. He ripens and brings growth. He sends out laborers. He's the starter. He's the finisher. Why would I say all this? Well, first of all, because Christ said it, he's the Lord of the harvest, that's who we're praying to, but because he's the one that's going to send us out. At the end of the day, he's the hero. He's going to send us out. And he says, pray to his, or that he would send out laborers, this Lord, into his harvest. So every laborer is his and every soul is his. Now, people would say, well, if that's the case, then what's the point of evangelizing? I mean, if he's Lord over it all, then why pray? Why evangelize? He chooses and doesn't choose anyhow, so what does it matter? Well, here's why it matters. Because first of all, you and I are not God. To understand how someone who is God's sovereign Lord still turns to disciples and says, look, this is what needs to happen. So our evangelism actually should be spurred on by our understanding of his lordship. So I'll give you an idea. Even when you are evangelizing, I have stopped saying I led someone to Christ. Because I've never led anyone to Christ now. Yes, I've proclaimed the gospel to people and I've saw God do a work, but there's a difference. And there's a difference in your courage when you understand that God is sovereign. He must send us out, so God send us out. You must save souls, so save souls. And so really I've looked at it like when I present the gospel, when you present the gospel to someone, you give them the gospel. And you let the Lord figure out if it's too much for them to handle or not. They're dead in their sin. They will not handle anything unless God brings them to life and brings them in. You give them the gospel and then you sit back like you're at a movie theater and you've got a front row seat. God, are you going to do it now? God, do it. Do it now. And he uses us in his sovereign will and plan. And it's not up to us to to be like, oh, this doesn't make sense, so I think it's stupid, so I'm not going to do it. He uses us and he commands us to go and he commands us to pray. And then we sit back and say, God, do the work. And then you get to say to someone, hey, I just saw God at work. Let me tell you what he did. It is very, very different. He is the Lord of the harvest, and it's his harvest. And so we're to pray with this in mind. So with all that in mind, to close, again, it is harvest time. I hope this morning that that's not just intriguing to you and to I. You know, I used to go through, uh, lived in small towns, Saskatchewan, grew up in small towns. Maybe that's why I like farming too. And we go to someone's house and they're a farmer i love especially harvest time going through the fields and you pick heads of grain and kids if you didn't know this this fall you can do this maybe if your parents allow allow it you get just like one head roll it up blow the chaff off you can chew that like wheat chew wheat and it turns into bubble gum you can't make a bubble but it's kind of cool you know and you like smell the fields you pick the grain you make your bubble gum you're still not farming and i think there's 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 a thing where for us right now, it's very dangerous that we'd be like, yeah, that's great, that's great, I agree, I agree, I agree, and you're just kind of running through the fields making bubble gum. You're like, mm, that smells good, yeah, and nothing changes. But you need to hear this. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. If you are in Christ, you are a laborer. You cannot be content just to be like, yeah, that was good. We have to go do it. The fields are white all the time. We are farmers, and so Lord, send us out to proclaim the good news. Again, there's this job to be done. Christ has done it, so we just basically tell of it. There's a heart to have, or break my heart, break our heart for those who are lost, to command and to pray. Pray for laborers, yes, pray for souls. And so we'll, I would just say, like, would we be a church of courageous evangelism then? And would that truly be one of our distinctives, you know, sharing the good news of the gospel? And so let me pray again for us, and, uh, and then we're going to close and just worship. 
our Lord in song. So let me pray. Father, we uh, just pause again to thank you, uh, first of all, for uh, who you are. Lord, that you would allow us to know you, to be reconciled to you because of Jesus Christ, that those of us here that are in Christ, um, we can pray to you full access. Uh, our eyes have been opened, our hearts have been changed, or we've been made brand new. It is all work of God, it's all grace. So Father, I pray, um, Lord, that you would send out your church today and tomorrow and the next day. Lord, this is your harvest, and so uh, make the opportunities happen. Lord, move us where you need to move us around. Lord, give us courage where we don't have us. Break our hearts, Lord, where they're not broken. Lord, and save souls. Lord, those that um, you have chosen, that you have elected, that uh, only you can change their heart, Lord, would you do it? And would we be able to have the great privilege of sharing the good news, but then also seeing the harvest come in? And so, Lord, please do this work. And we commit it to you, and Lord, we worship you now, rightly so in song. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.